Good evening, everyone. Um, hope you're all doing well, staying healthy and safe, um, and uh, enjoying the nice weather wherever you guys are. Uh, so my name is Alvin Chin. I am the chair of um, ACM uh, Chicago section, and also as well the chair for IEEE uh, Computer Society Chicago. So this is uh, joined with ACM uh, Chicago with IEEE Computer Society Chicago and also ACM uh, New York City too as well. So we thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, we have a wonderful uh, presentation this evening. Uh, we have uh, Phil Rosenfield of uh, Microsoft uh, Research. Some bit of uh, introduction before we start. Uh, so IEEE Computer Society Chicago. So uh, this is the Chicago chapter of the IEEE Computer Society. So if you're familiar with ACM, IEEE is kind of similar to um, ACM. IEEE stands for Institute for Electrical and Electronic uh, Engineers. Uh, we, since the pandemic, have held uh, joint meetings um, monthly with ACM Chicago. Uh, so thank you all for your support on that. And we usually have you know, meetings regarding about software, hardware, computing, AI, big data, cloud computing, cybersecurity, and others. Uh, like I said earlier, I am the chair. Our vice chair is Gina Martinez. Um, you can see the uh, social media sites and also our web uh, if you want to keep on following us. And if you want to be an IEEE Computer Society member, shameless plug, you can go to um, this uh, www.computer.org slash membership uh, slash join. And also as well, um, wanted to give a shout out also to ACM uh, Chicago. Uh, members uh, who are we are the host uh, of this, and we've had the same you know monthly meetings together with IEEE uh, Computer Society Chicago. Uh, so I'm the chair, um, Alvin Chin, and um, our vice chair. Now uh, you can see in the uh, in the panelists is uh, Mark Temkin, and our treasurer is uh, Greg Newmark. Our web is ChicagoACM.org. Uh, you probably have uh, registered for our event tonight uh, from our meetup site. Uh, we also have presence on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And very importantly, if you have missed any previous uh, webinars or meetings from ACM Chicago, you can go to our YouTube and subscribe there. So when we get you get the we when you get the latest ones, uh, you'll know the, the latest um, uh, video recordings that we have. So just go to bit.ly slash ACM uh, CHI video um, and you will be able to get to the YouTube channel and you can subscribe and get our latest um, recordings uh, when they are available. And again, um, you know, if you want to become an ACM member, um, there's lots of you know, interesting things becoming an ACM member. Uh, you can go to acm.org uh, slash uh, membership. And uh, before we introduce Ethel uh, Rosenfield, uh, this is also joined with ACM uh, New York City. So we also thank uh, Dan as well for uh, collaborating with us this uh, evening uh, for this presentation. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mark, our vice chair, to introduce uh, Phil Rosenfield. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, glad you're all here. We're glad to have Phil Rosenfield from Microsoft Research. It's certainly a really fascinating place. Of course, we all know about Microsoft products and the things they've done over the years. But the research part, uh, uh, that's not something that many of us know about. Let's learn about this from our speaker. Phil Rosenfield. Let's have a big Zoom applause for our speaker. Uh, thank, thank you all so much for having me. Um, as you know, since I'm part of Microsoft, this is a, a, this is a platform uh, that I don't use all the time. So if you bear with me, I'm going to try to sh share my screen. Um, so just a moment, please. Okay, that, I think that, that went well. It, it, it did everything right. I'm going to give a research program manager's view of Microsoft Research. So I'm a research programmer, uh, program manager at Microsoft Research, and uh, I've been at Microsoft for about four and a half years now. So I'm saying, you know, one person's uh, view, and uh, hopefully, um, I'm really happy to answer all questions. So let's get let's get started. Here's what I was going to talk about today. First, I'll just give a little in, uh, introduction to Microsoft Research. Uh, and then I'll also talk about Health Futures. Uh, the reason is because I also am working at, with Health Futures and uh, you, I think you may be interested in that as well. 
Then I'll talk a bit about my path. How do I fit in? How do I get here? And then I'll, I'll give some, share some opportunities that are available for early and career researchers, um, as well as, uh, and, and then end with a Q and A. Uh, so here we are. So first let's talk about Microsoft Research. So Microsoft Research started in 1991. Um, Bill Gates called up Rick Rashid from CMU to, to say that, you know, we're, we're doing great here, but we really want to know where, where and what we should be looking at on the five, 10, 30 year time scale. Uh, when Rick Rashid joined, he looked at what was going on at CMU. They looked at at and Bell Labs, at Xerox Park, at some of these real famous um, industrial research labs and research lab settings and thought, how can we fit this around Microsoft? What they came up with was really a two-part, I guess, uh, vision statement, which is one, the first one was to um, increase the state of the art and push the state of the art in computer science and related fields. And the second is to return those insights back to Microsoft. With that first goal being real academic focus, uh, it, which it still is, has really uh, set Microsoft Research apart from a lot of different uh, industrial research labs at the time, and now is a model for uh, a lot of different uh, research labs like DeepMind and uh, Facebook's FAIR, uh, the Facebook AI uh, research lab, for example. I, I placed the current uh, mission statement up from the website, and you'll see, um, you'll, you'll see the term empower, which comes directly from the Microsoft's uh, um, mission statement. So the, it's a lot, very much entwined but it's to accelerate scientific discovery and technology um, for every person and every organization on the planet by bringing together the best minds across diverse disciplines and backgrounds. Uh, Microsoft Research has nine labs. Uh, the, the headquarters are in Redmond with the rest of Microsoft. I work uh, outside, out of Microsoft Research New England, and I also support Microsoft Research New York City and Montreal. Uh, most recently, the Microsoft Research Amsterdam lab came up. Um, Microsoft Research Cambridge is the reason why the New England lab that was located right next to MIT campus in Cambridge is not called Cambridge. Uh, there's two labs in Microsoft in Asia, and then there's one in Bangalore called Mike, that they go by Microsoft Research India. When I uh, I did a I'll tell a bit about this later. I did a PhD internship at Microsoft Research when I was working on my PhD, and it was explained to me at the time uh, as the largest computer science department uh, in the world. Um, I, I can see why they would why why they would call themselves that, but it's actually it's more than just computer science. Uh, here are the current research areas across all the, the labs, and you see the ones that are, are very much uh, core to computer science, uh, you know, programming language, software engineering, systems and networking, algorithms and theory. But then you also are seeing some that are driven by uh, more adjacent fields that still have, are, are really critical to uh, understanding uh, how computers and, uh, and, and, and driving, sorry, really critical to driving uh, Microsoft research mission. Uh, economics, for example, uh, social sciences, um, uh, technology for emerging markets. Uh, so there are people who are who are also doing cryptography, who are doing pure mathematics, uh, and and more. And all of these research areas are, are really thematic. There's many subfields within them, and many researchers cross over uh, into many of them at the same time. Now, in Microsoft Research, New England, New York City, and Montreal, we uh, we really have folks in these areas mostly. Um, uh, the socio, social sciences is a really big, uh, as the largest group in Microsoft Research New England. Uh, some of them study uh, how people work together and there's been a lot of advances in the future of work um, with them. Uh, in the economics, um, they're working on uh, causal machine learning and bringing uh, computation into economics. So it's really, a, uh, there's a lot of economic theory as well as uh, economics and computation. Yeah, medical health and genomics is one of the focuses that I'm in, and I'll give a few projects spotlights on that because of it. Um, but we also have uh, HCI, human-computer interaction. We have some folks who are working um, with 
uh, with American Sign Language, trying to uh, make 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 uh, uh, make technology more accessible, uh, and and so on. So, in narrowing down even further, these are the areas that I work in. Like I said, I'm giving a very uh, myopic view of Microsoft Research because I'm giving it from my vantage point. So, I'll I'll be touching on some of these uh, uh, today. For the, for the first one though, I'd like to kind of spotlight uh, one project um, and uh, I'll go through a few of them. So this one is ML is machine learning. I'm gonna be using that acronym a lot, either vocally or just on the screen. So if you see ML, that's, that's what I mean. So ML for Oncology, this is a project that we started a while ago. We've ha had a paper on it and we are currently uh, working on, on putting another paper uh, together on it as well. A lot, of, a, a lot of what Microsoft Research output is, is uh, academic papers or scholarly papers. So uh, how can machine learning help oncology? How can it help cancer, tra cancer treatment? So in this case, we're trying to help predict the patient response to immunotherapy. Another way to think about that is the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. So immunotherapy is the promise of precision cancer medicine. I'll, um, and, and so they're, they're trying to find uh, exact, you know, precise treatment for the individual. And what our goal was to do is try to find that out, try, try to better predict what treatment what the patient response will be so we can give the patient the correct treatment earlier. Uh, those of you who, who know or have even had cancer yourself know that getting treatment uh, is really important at the right time. And if you're getting the wrong treatment, you're wasting critical time uh, that, that, that could be life-changing. Life so giving a, a little bit of background, I'm going to give a very high level background on cancer and the immune system so I can set up the, the project that we we're working on. Um, basically, cancer is caused by mutations. Um, cancer cells uh, aren't, you know, there's cancer cells in a normal, in, and, and here's a normal, uh, here, here would be a cancer tumor, and on the left here you have a T cell or an immune cell. So the T cells are circulate throughout our bloodstream. They're all looking, they, they are on, always on the search for something that is foreign. Um, and all cells have an internal system that are present that are uh, these proteins that are called antigens. And specific T cells can attach themselves to an antigen. Uh, and, and to understand whether, hey, are, are you part of you know, the self? Are you part of this human body or are you a foreign invader? Uh, if it binds to this antigen and it's not the cell, what it, one way it can it can kill that cell is by using what, what's called PD-1, a programmed death, which basically tells the foreign cell to destroy itself. So when that goes well, it 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 works and the cell goes away. But cancer has found has adapted around it and has been able to trick the immune system into thinking that that cancer cell is actually part of the human body and is a human cell, and so it won't be killed this way. Immunotherapy has come in, a specific type of immunotherapy called checkpoint inhibitor. Um, these drugs block the cancer from this. They uh, inhibit PD PD-1 or they inhibit PD-L1. So there's different drugs for each type. Uh, either you're, it'll, inhib it'll inhibit the PD-1 on the T cell or it can inhibit PD-L1 on a specific cancer tumor cell. And so this is the this is the precision oncology that we're talking about, and this has caused an immunotherapy revolution. So the promise of precision therapy that we can teach the immune system or um, to to recognize and fight cancer on its own is what has had huge promise. And since 2018, this was a whole nature issue, uh, all dedicated to the cancer immunotherapy revolution. But there's a lot of issues with it. Sometimes immunotherapy doesn't improve survival. Some patients will suffer from really, excuse me, horrific side effects um, and not even be have benefit. Uh, sometimes there are, the immune system just can't be ex, uh, you know, excited enough to fight it. Sometimes they're exhausted immune systems or the immune system just too old to, to, to do it even if it did have the right tools. And then we also are just looking at 
you know, tumors and tumor mutations, what about the rest of the microbiome, the, the whole cell environment that maybe could enhance the um, efficacy of cancer immunotherapy? So there are all these open questions. The, the main takeaway here is that while immunotherapy is, is working on some individuals, the promise of precision cancer medic um, oncology has just not happened yet. So we joined with um, researchers at Memorial Sloan Kettering to try to use machine learning methods to uh, better predict patient response uh, in PDL1 inhibitors for bladder cancer. How did we do it? So uh, we were we were trying to approach with a multifactorial uh, analysis. Well, we're, what has been done before is they look at the the amount of the the, term, the amount of mutations in the tumor, the tumor mutation burden, and if there's a certain threshold met, then they will give a certain type of immunotherapy. Um, but like I alluded to, that doesn't always have beneficial patient response at the right time. And so we were trying to help uh, uh, our our collaborator at the time, Alex Snyder, um, work uh, with, with their data set, with their, uh, um, which was uh, pu um, public, was a public data set. So we want to, so when, uh, T, when uh, T cell does find something that is a foreign invader, what it will do is it will have this cascade of clones and just cl replicate itself over and over again. So you'll have this huge colonial expansion of T cells found. That means that it's respond, it's typically means that it's responding to some, uh, is creating an immune response. So we're trying to predict how many T cell clones were found in the tumor before therapy that expand, expand into the blood after therapy. There was this public data set. There's 29 patients treated with that pdl one inhibitor. And there was cancer and T cell sequencing. So this was really great uh, data set to be able to look at what was happening pre-therapy and post-therapy. So looking at the tumor, uh, sequencing the tumor itself, sequencing T cell receptors from the blood itself in the tumor, and then the blood as well. To... And the multifactorial prediction was done with 19 pretreatment attributes. So we were looking uh, at clinical tumor and anything circulating. So this is something that machine learning can is has been really a, a boon for us. So I, I would make an argument, and maybe this is gonna be an underlying theme in the, pro, the projects I show, that machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence, while yes, it, it helps, you know, your uh, pr predict your next text that you're gonna do, it gives you a, you know, co-pilot, um, uh, GitHub co-pilot or whatever, uh, and, and does a lot of other kind of neat generative things with images. I think we're, we have yet to see the main benefit, which is to really un, um, help us uh, understand and tr uh, our own uh, biology and apply it to the huge amount of data that we have just understanding uh, our own biology and health. So here we were able to com combine 19 pretreatment attributes and then to try to predict the number of expanded TILs or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in the blood three weeks after treatment. So the way that the, uh, the researchers are using it, they've used elastic net. This is um, a machine learning method for regression that just automatically submit, selects the informative features in the data. So you're trying to get the signal from all the different data. And you know, it, it, rather than model the clinical response of each patient directly, we were able to model the response of each patient's immune system by using these, combining this information and use that predicted immune response to stratify patients based on their expected clinical benefit. This is, uh, so our method better predicts the earlier stage of treatment. So this is previous method with mutation burden. And so if you were to use these, so what we're seeing is non-responders are in the blue box and responders are in the green box. And you see there's quite a lot of overlap in mutation burden. So if you were to use mutation burden alone to decide whether or not they should have this pdl one inhibitor, you'd be treating a lot of non-responders too, which is a critical uh, time period as I've mentioned before. Yeah. Our results 
uh, using the predicted number of expanded TIL clones, there's much better separation between non-responders and responders, meaning that you won't be wasting people's precious time by giving them this treatment. You have a better idea of whether or not they'll respond to it uh, based on those uh, features that from, from that data set. Since this paper, we've uh, expanded uh, their work with new collaborators at, at Sloan Kettering, and we're um, the paper's in prep, but um, when we had early, our first early uh, uh, data to, to, or our first early results to present, we uh, presented at the World Conference on Lung Cancer at, in 2019 um, using another multifactorial response. But instead of uh, bladder cancer, we were focused on non-small cell lung cancer. So that's, that's just one spotlight uh, that I've worked on in, in this space. In the last couple of years, that project uh, has kind of blossomed into a, a full group at Microsoft Research that is working also with Microsoft Health Features in the overlap between biomedical uh, science and machine learning. Health Futures uh, is also a part of Microsoft in the Microsoft Research and Incubation. It's almost a, like a sister to Microsoft Research, um, where it's not only the research it's also incubations and other moonshots. And they're, they're tied more for cross-company strategy partnerships and real-world impact across healthcare and the life sciences. There's uh, four main uh, themes uh, that uh, in, in health futures, biomedical imaging, Microsoft Immunotics, which had a, a, a T cell, a, a COVID test that could look at T cell response, which lasts longer than the antigen response for a COVID test. Uh, biomedical NLP, so large language models for biology, for example, and Microsoft Genomics, uh, which is a, a whole group looking at rare diseases and um, other, other things. I, I'll, I'll let you dive in individually at the website below, but I'm going to give another spotlight on uh, digital histopathology. So uh, digital histopathology, histopathology is well, I'll back up and say pathology is really just the study of illness, trying to figure out what it what it was caused. Histopathology is you is tissues, looking at human tissue. So that could be a that could be a biopsy of a colon of a of a breast, uh, any anything like that. Uh, and now they're becoming digitized. So there's some a lot of opportunities for machine learning and artificial intelligence in digital pathology. And I'll outline a couple of them here. First is pathology is a real key component of medical care. Um, taking a biopsy, freezing it, cutting it up, staining it, and putting it on a microscopy slide tells a lot to uh, pathologists on what is going on in that in your body, especially when it comes to cancer. In cancer, uh, it, is, it is sometimes used to define what grade of cancer someone has or what stage of cancer they have. It helps inform diagnosis. Um, just by looking at these uh, pathology slides. The ability to digitize the glass slides, it's been around for about 25 years. And, um, and uh, the, it seems like there's becoming more and more are being digitized in the future. In 2021, there's the first FDA approval, approval for a pathology AI application. And it claimed to reduce the time to diagnosis by 65%. Um, I know there's a lot of hype around AI replacing people and so on and, and doing this for you. And I don't think that anyone in my orbit is working towards that at all. Everything that we're thinking about in digital pathology is about augmenting a pathologist or helping um, point out finding regions of interest and things like that. This is never gonna replace a, a human, but could do, um, could, could, could do as well as a few humans put together. And typically, uh, at least in the United States, we don't have several pathology experts looking at each biopsy. You have your doctor, and then maybe you'd go for a second opinion if you need to. Um, so maybe machine learning can help uh, ag um, aggregate uh, like that. So what about histopathology data that's so useful for machine learning? Well, it's kind of both big and small. A whole slide image or a, a digitized 
piece of glass uh, that has a pathology specimen or a biopsy specimen on it can be hundreds of thousands of pixels uh, across. They can be up to 50 gigabytes uh, uh, image size. 500 full slide images is about equal to ImageNet on a pixel basis, which is the state of the art in computer vision training. However, that uh, we might not have that many full slide images from the same patient. So you may need to train models on lots of different patients. So the events of interest though, given that huge size, the events of interest, say you're looking for nuclei of the cell, or you're looking to uh, see where cells are, where they're not, or label what type of uh, cell it is or, or what type of tissue it is. That's something that can happen all the way down to 45 pixels, even smaller size. So that's a real needle in a haystack problem to find what you need. And machine learning is really great at finding patterns in images. Furthermore, when you have a lot of experts, when there, there has been studies with board certified pathologists showing disagreement in, um, in a lot of these types of annotations. So you have a huge image looking for very small things and you have, let's call them noisy labels. So some of our current research directions are looking at these really rare and small events with limited data and that label noise. There's some real challenges that you don't see when uh, looking at typical computer vision approaches. For example, uh, trying to detect a person walking across the street in a fully automated car driving. That, you, don't, you don't need these types of label noise. Or trying to figure out who's, how, many, uh, how, how many Yankees fans are at the Red Sox games by taking an aerial photo, for example, wearing Yankees caps or something. You, you don't, th those computer vision approaches aren't really as the, the, have the same nuances that histopathology data would have. So we're looking at different procedures, two set procedures. First, we can detect mitosis, for example, and then maybe we can classify it into the different stages. Uh, we're using variational autoencoders and semi-supervised learning um, and looking at other in, um, uncertainty aware approaches. All right, for the, the next part is what was my, how did I get here and what do I do? Um, so if there are any biologists or pathologists or oncologists in the audience, you'll know that I'm not any of those at this point. I have a PhD in astronomy. Um, I was uh, um, at, from the University of Washington. And while I was there, I did an internship in Microsoft Research. And then I did a couple of postdocs and uh, I'll go slower into this to, to explain kind of a little bit more. Um, and then became a, a software, the director of a software program for a nonprofit before coming to MSR. So my, my PhD in astronomy, if, in case there are questions at the end, I always love talking astronomy, uh, was on, uh, I, I studied stars and other galaxies using the Hubble Space Telescope um, with a lot of preparation to use the James Webb Space Telescope. So it's fun watching that take place. So on the leftmost image is, uh, one, is one of the figures from the, my, the first paper that I was uh, a principal investigator on. And we were looking at really bright stars that shouldn't be in the center of the Andromeda galaxy, but were there um, and trying to understand what they were and more information about them. After I passed my qualifying exam, <clears throat> everyone told me to take the summer off. Um, I really was skeptical about that. But at the same time, Microsoft Research uh, was working on visualizing SQL databases. And um, they, they needed to find a database that they could visualize that was in the public domain. And they chose astronomy because astronomy images are in the public domain. Uh, they, they created what they called, um, I think they called it in, uh, internet application. This was around 2008, 2009. So this was a desktop program that actually accessed the internet and stitched together all of these data sets in real time. You can see some screenshots on the far right. You can still look it up. It's still, it's still there. It's worldwide telescope. It's still being improved upon. But that summer they had the idea of re re reaching out towards uh, educational purposes and seeing if they could, uh, could project it in planetariums. Um, and this is apropos to this group because their first uh, partnership was with the Adler Planetarium. So I spent the summer learning how to 
broadcast this inf this uh, web app into a planetarium, and we installed it at the Adler uh, in the middle of the summer. And then uh, we, I also built a, a mobile planetarium, so I using a, a single surface mirror to reflect, and uh, also um, built one out of paperboard, which is just thick cardboard, so a class could do it on their own. Um, Kind of with some geodesic dome concepts that you can that I actually got from websites from uh, Burning Man, which is you know it's fun to see how all these <laughs> things piece together. Uh, so I so that internship I got to learn all about what Microsoft Research was like. I'd never heard of it before. I didn't know anything about. I knew. I mean, it was just like the intro. I knew all about Microsoft and its products. Actually, I didn't even know about all the enterprise products. Honestly, I still don't know about all the products, not kind of one person customer facing. Um, but I had no idea what MSR was and it was such a fun place to work. I was there in 2010 and I got to see uh, early demos of the Connect. And there was one memory that just really pops out which was this early demo and researchers were trying to break it. And so they were moving around spinning and then the way they ended up breaking is by hugging each other and then spinning around. It was just really funny to watch. Uh, just the excitement of it, the openness of it. And um, it was just a really fun place to be. So I always just had it in the back of my mind to join as a data scientist or something if I, if, if you know, the, the PhD to faculty didn't work out. Which to be honest, at the time I was getting my PhD, the numbers were 7% of astronomy PhDs end up as faculty. So I, I wasn't too hopeful that I was gonna be part of the 7%. I went on to a postdoc at in Padova uh, at the University of Padova, and I studied uh, thermally, um, thermally pulsating asymptotic giant branch stars, TPAGB stars, is what I wanted to say. And so what you're looking at in this middle panel are three uh, images, or sorry, three plots of stars from other galaxies where I'm picking out exactly where the AGB stars are. The issue with the AGB stars are they are blasting their surfaces out into outer space around them. They're incredibly bright and they actually live relatively long time to other stars of their brightness. And the issue is uh, if you're looking at a galaxy so far away that you can't see individual stars, you don't know if you're looking at a star that's a million years old or one of these AGB stars that's gone through all of its lifespan already and it's probably five billion years old. Uh, so if you want to understand the age of the universe and the, by understanding the age of distance galaxies, you need to understand these stars. And these stars also, once they blast out their atmosphere into space, that atmosphere cools down. When it cools down, the color becomes redder and more in, in the infrared. And so it's going to, the problem I just mentioned is going to be even more so now in the era of JWST, which is an infrared telescope for all intents and purposes. So I was looking at how do we better model these to better understand what we'll be getting from JWST. Uh, after that, um, and I'll tell this group, literally on the same day I was preparing a job application for Microsoft Research Data Scientist role, I was, uh, my proposal to the National Science Foundation was accepted, and so I got to do an astronomy and astrophysics postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard for a couple of years. And there is where I kind of took the ideas from the previous two experiences, my PhD and my postdoc, and added Bayesian uh, analysis and tried to really understand what are the tunable things that we know about in stars and stellar modeling that we can fudge with to try to understand what the best, uh, what, what try, basically to try to get some uncertainty propagated to what people are actually seeing. Um, that was really fun too. And I also got to build another planetarium while I was there. That was great. At that same time, Worldwide Telescope was being open sourced. Uh, Microsoft Research was no longer supporting it. And there was a whole education community and research and, and budding research community that wanted to use it. And I took a six month leave of absence to become the program director for the American Astronomical Society, which is a nonprofit. It, I, honestly, I, I explained it to people within MSR as the ACM for astronomy. Um, it was really fun working for them. Uh, I worked in um, with the publication uh, under the publication wing or department. Uh, we were trying to get people to uh, researchers to use Worldwide Telescope, uh, and the way that uh, I thought it would be used is if we made a Python interface for it. And so that's what I did. I, I was able to hire a couple of programmers to do it, and that's still in use. And you can visualize your data now in Worldwide Telescope on the web. 
Um, and it's really, uh, it was really great. It also taught me a really valuable lesson, which was I like working with a diverse group of people with a diverse group of, ba of backgrounds more than I like working with pure researchers, astronomers, and one poor admin. <laughs> Um, so my time in academia was really coming to a close, and this really showed me how much uh, enjoyment I got out of not doing research. Uh, at the same time, this research program management position popped up at Microsoft Research New England, and I quickly applied and I actually cut my postdoc a couple months early for it. Which brings me to the next point. What do research program managers do? Or I guess I should say, what do I do? Uh, I just put down a list, <laughs> not meant to go through every single one of these, um, but I, I wanted to put down a, a, a list of all the different things that I've worked on, and this isn't all of them, but this is quite a bit of the stuff that I've done in the past four and a half years at Microsoft Research. Uh, my first day on the job, I installed a Linux server for researchers to use for on a new project, and I thought, did I really leave academia? What I, what's happening here? Uh, so I didn't put Unix admin there because I kind of I, I didn't have to do much of that once I once I got it up and running, they they took care of it themselves. Um, uh, and then the next the next year, I felt like I was learning all of. Uh, the ins and outs of trying to work with academic medical centers and you know telling them yes microsoft's a for profit company but we want to write publications with you we want to we want to learn from you that's that's really where we're coming from even though we are part of this other thing um, and so trying to kind of uh, thread that needle was really fun and then the year after that i felt like i was doing even more expansive uh, um, external partnership trying to find you know working with startups who wanted to to work with microsoft research and how could we work together how can we succeed together or maybe it's just not a good fit um, trying to find that stuff out early and finally uh i got to volunteer to work in early career program management and i thought that uh I would went leaving academia meant I couldn't teach and I couldn't work with students anymore, but I was completely wrong in that. And um, what started as just kind of uh, my own free time within work to volunteer for these programs became uh, more of a core part of my, my role, which is really fun too. So that's the next piece of it, which is some of the early and career opportunities at Microsoft, excuse me, research and health futures. I'm also including some for Microsoft all up but I just want you to know I'm not, I'll, I'll differentiate which ones I'm involved in and not. Again, this is from my vantage point. Uh, the first one, this program has been going on for around five years. Uh, I think six years now, we're going into our sixth year. This is called the Microsoft Research Undergraduate Research Internship Program. So yeah, there's a lot of research in there, but typically we say MSR, Undergraduate Research Internship Program. The, these, this is a 12 week internship. Uh, in Redmond, New York City, or New England. Uh, it's aimed at rising juniors and seniors who are passionate about technology and offer diverse perspectives. So the big news is the call to action. This Monday, we're opening up applications for our next cohort in the, in the next incoming spring, summer. So that's the website to go to. Uh, tell your friends, tell everyone's friends, tell uh, everyone who should come. The goal of this program, the, the premise of this program, what, what we think is. Um, um, it, let me phrase it a little bit better. We, we, want the, we want to identify who are the next leaders in, in research in you know, computational science and, and adjacent fields. And we acknowledge that these researchers are going to should and must have diverse perspectives. So what this application is, is you, they, these students, they're, you know, they don't have to have a paper by now. This, we're looking for uh, people who are interested in doing research. They're gonna write a research interest statement and they're gonna write about uh, experience and in increasing, uh, experience in their leadership in, diverse, uh, in diversity and inclusion. And so by, we, we rank those together, that research interest statement, interest statement and the experience in leadership and diversity and inclusion. And we think that by doing that, we're, we're gonna get, uh, we're, we're gonna identify and, and try to help promote the careers of uh, a really great generation of stewards uh, of computer science and adjacent fields. And we're five years in, and for the students that have graduated, 
Uh, 80% of them are in PhD programs now. Um, some of them did not have any research, ex many of them didn't have any research experience before starting it, did not have access to research experience while they were um, at their university. So we're not just grabbing people from research ones, we're looking everywhere we can um, uh, that, that, that could do this. So uh, research areas are very broad. You can see they mimic uh, the research areas of MSR. Uh, because we assign people to researchers within MSR uh, based on the research interests of the students. So there's only a couple that aren't that aren't listed here of the, the main ones. Um, next, and this is a much smaller program, uh, this is the New uh, MSR New England and New York City Predoctoral Research Assistant Program. So this is another one I'm, I'm involved in uh, running. And this is a one to two year now, full-time research assistantships. So uh, these are, it's uh, really for recent graduates. They're for people who have just finished their bachelor's or their master's, and they're interested in gaining experience before pursuing a PhD in their field. Um, we have, there, there's only a few research areas that do this. Uh, economics and computation is, the, is one, BioML, the one that I'm, I work with, social technical systems and cognitive social sciences. Uh, those are the, the main research areas there. Um, you know, you you you're, you may wonder why isn't ML there? Why isn't uh, in in the my reasoning? And this is again just me. Uh, these fields that have uh, research areas listed, that one to two year gap between a bachelor's or a master's and a PhD is already there. We're not increasing anything. We're not saying, oh, now everybody needs two more years of experience before going to a PhD. That's not the idea. These are us. Uh, 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 pre-docs and economics and computation is, happens all over the U.S. The Fed has several positions. The Fed in Chicago has several positions. It's a really great program there, for example. So we're not uh, lengthening the time to PhD in any sense, where we just have uh, great researchers, access to uh, you know internal Microsoft data that can be really great for economists to work with. Uh, for example, and or also social technical systems work on projects with Xbox and stuff is really kind of a neat, neat place to be for those things. And one, one to two years great uh, time period to really get uh, a lot of experience on several different projects working with several different researchers and even reaching out, reaching to work with somebody at MSR that what wasn't in your specific lane. Um, we find that master's students are often, you know, maybe they got a master's in mathematics and they want to pivot to uh, economics or something, or they, they are, for example. So there are pivoters that come through here too, uh, as well. So right now there's applications open for the uh, pre-doc in economics and computation. That's the website to go to. That's the call to action where we're, um, I think we have until October 4th, uh, I believe is when that one you should go to the website to be sure. I believe it's October 4th. Oh. <clears throat> Here are more opportunities that I'm not directly involved in. Uh, do the internship that I did it over a decade ago, the PhD research inter internship. If uh, you or someone you know is doing a PhD in one of the research areas, have a look at this website in the next few months uh, and apply. The PhD research internships are just, they're great experiences. Uh, I get to work with these students all the time. They work together. They work with researchers. It's just a really great, it's a really great internship. Yeah, you know, there's summer internships, twelve weeks long. Uh, product group internship. Not everybody needs to do research, um, or they can do user research. Um, these are the more typical internships you would see at Microsoft. Uh, these are you could be a program manager, one software engineer, data scientist, design. These are internships uh, for product groups uh, throughout Microsoft. So if you wanna work on Teams, you wanna work on Word or Office for Mac or something like that, this is, these are the product group internships. Um, these ones are uh, also 12 week summer internships. They can be for undergraduates. Uh, I believe they're for uh, universe, current university students. So I think you have to uh, be within one year of your graduation to do it, but check the website to be sure. And then there's two more that I wanna throw out. Um, one is called LEAP. Uh, this was an immersive 16 week, ex week experience. It's almost like a training. Uh, it's a base foundation to join Microsoft. And these, this is aimed at people who are maybe going for a second act in their career, or maybe they've been a stay at home mom for a long time and wanna go back to work, things like that. This is the LEAP uh, program that brings you into Microsoft. It's not also, uh, it's not a research position. It's also with product groups. 
Uh, MADAP is another one I listed. This is the Microsoft AI Development Acceleration Program. This is, um, I believe it's a two-year uh, thing as well. It's a program for recent bachelor's, master's, PhD grads, and they get a, the, to do a lot of AI opportunities at Microsoft. They, they're also joining as PM uh, software engineers and data scientists, and they work uh, kind of in between. They work in, in um, a pod amongst themselves with a sponsor from a product group to uh, do something specific AI related to create some AI product for them. Um, there's one more, uh, I believe, since we're, I, I, I caught on late that uh, folks from New York were here too, that I forgot to put in. There's two more things that I forgot to put in. One is DS3, sorry, D3S, which is the Data Science Summer School, which is for local New York uh, um, students who want to learn uh, data science at Microsoft Research New York City. Uh, that's a really cool program. You get a stipend and it comes with a stipend and a laptop. And uh, you take a course and you do a project over the summer. So check that out for, and I believe it's for undergrads. The other one is the Microsoft Research Summit, which is a really, uh, really great way to get a trans much better, less myopic view of what Microsoft Research is up to. Um, with, uh, and that's coming up in October. So if you go to the Microsoft Research website, any of the this top website will take you there too. It's, it's being blasted all over. I'm sorry, I didn't put a link up. Uh, if I have a chance, I'll throw it in the chat. Uh, sign up. I've signed up, you know, just kind of as a fan to, to see some of the, the uh, Precision Health per um, talks. Um, but there's Future of Work. There's uh, all sorts of uh, AI at scale, all sorts of different tracks for different time zones. Um, so with that, I think, um, I think I'm at 45 minutes-ish. Um, I will... Uh, go to the Q&A and just thank you all so much for your time and uh, thanks again for having me. So thank you, Phil, for that. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, so I will give it to Mark to um, address those questions uh, to you, Phil. So post it in the chat for those. Um, I, I grabbed the links that uh, Phil had posted on his slides, so I put it into the chat too as well. Wow, thanks, Albert. Okay. Well, here's a good question first. Uh, which I'm going to embellish. Considering we have uh, both the cub Cubs and the Sox here, uh, why is there no MSR office in Chicago or in the Midwest? That's a great question. I mean, I am the office, I guess, in <laughs> Minneapolis now. I'm, I'm remote, located in Minneapolis. No, I, that's that's beyond me. Uh, and also, I you know, I, was, I, I don't know why I ended up with uh, Sox, Red Sox, uh, Red Sox, Yankees uh, quip there. Um, with my practice, I, I was using the twins, um, but uh, you know, I, look, if it was up to me, you know, it'd be a great place to to have it. To, Chicago would be a great place to have to have an MSR. Believe me, right next to the Toyota Institute. I mean, Northwestern. Every you know, it's a, it'd be a, a, a fantastic spot. Is there any point uh, when someone's a PhD student where uh, they've run out of time to apply for the program? No, I don't. I, I don't think so. I mean, no, there isn't. I think for the PhD internships, um, I, I I think people are you know they're typically encouraged to work on something outside the direct path of their dissertation anyway. Um, so it, it doesn't. It's not going to be a chapter in a dissertation typically. Um, so I, I I don't I don't think there's any time frame that I know of. Um, it just says, you know, current PhD student. So as long as you're still checking that mark box, then I think it's typically okay. Any tips for writing the PhD fellowship application? Well, let me caveat with, I'm not, I'll caveat this way by saying, I, I don't review the, the PhD uh, fellowships. I don't review the PhD internships uh, at all. So I, and I'm, I'm less familiar with how the fellowships get ranked than how the PhD internships are. The PhD internships, you apply to, basically you can apply to all of them. <laughs> you can apply to as many as you want and they go to directly to researcher, a researcher or a group of researchers. So, you know, you, you read that it's just like applying to any other job. You read it carefully and make sure that you're making it really easy for the reviewer or the, whoever's reading it to, to understand that you have the skills that 
they need to check off those boxes and that you you you'd be a really great ad and and, and so on. So I, I sorry it's a bit of a generic answer, but I I, I don't have enough experience um, to answer it better than that. One of our audience is interested in the HCI part of the cancer health informatics. Uh, do you have any suggestions on what to work on? And also, uh, this person would like to know is, uh, when does the summer recruiting begin? Summer internships start uh, October, November-ish. You'll start seeing things posted in the career site. I mean, they can pop up any time, but typically you'll, you see them in the fall because I think uh, they're trying to match they typically match academic cycles. So, you know, when you apply to grad schools, December, it's typically when things get applied, you, you, it's typically the same way. Um, the first part of the question, can you, can you remind me that again? What, oh, what's um, right. Um, they're interested in HCA, they're in the HCA part of the cancer health informatics. And uh, this person would like to know, do you have any suggestions on what to work on? On what to work on on their own? Um, you, you, you know, find something that you're interested in, just go. I mean, the, what, the, the worst thing I think people can do is get really good at something they don't like and then they, they're stuck doing that. Um, I don't have, you know, I don't have a great grasp, but there's a lot of you, but when you mention HCI, you know, there's a lot of overlap with user experience and design UXD um, in medical and health. A, a huge amount um, going on, and I would check out. I would check out UXD. I would I would type that in and and see if you find uh, find interesting roles there, um, because there's a lot of you know there's things that are patient facing. There's things that are doctor facing. There are things that are are um, are provider facing. I should say uh, that are really not intuitive and distilling huge amounts of information down is yeah, it's absolutely an HCI problem. And you, you may find, um, if not an MSR necessarily, you may find really neat startups that have got some really cool internships that can get you where you wanna go as well. Um, there is, a, there is a, a UXD group within Health Futures that you can check out. I don't know if they have, have internship, have, have as much internships, um, but there are probably product group internships that are working on that are working in that space in health. There's a big health Microsoft healthcare uh, group that is probably has a lot of stuff there. So product group internships might be a good spot too, especially in design, if you're thinking about that. Here's a geographic question. Are there any opportunities for remote internships or internships for Canada? Yes. Yes to both, um, definitely. I, I think there are some folks that are working in hardware uh, so if you if you want to work on controllers or the adaptive controllers and things like that, you're going to, it's going to be more difficult to not be in person. Um, but we've done two, you know two two almost three years of virtual and hybrid uh, internships. Uh, and if you're in Canada, you should check out Microsoft Research Montreal. Uh, they have internships that are a little bit different than the ones in the U.S. too. They're, they don't do three months all summer. They do I think it's something like one week. Uh, or a day a week every, for for several months or something. Uh, I don't. I'm not. I can't remember exactly. I'm not too involved, obviously. But Microsoft Research is in Montreal, um, and there was also product groups uh, in Toronto and in Vancouver. Uh, so depending on where um, on, on where you are, uh, you might find something uh, that you, that you'd like in person. But you can also uh, remote is also uh, a possibility. Uh, could you provide a link for MSR summer internships for current PhD students in the systems and networking group? And I can get that no. to you later. No, <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> the, the, it's all going to be everyone posted that same place, that re, Microsoft Research Careers site. Um, so when the systems group comes up, they will do that. Um, but you can go to the, um, if you go to the the link, uh, aka.ms slash about MSR that I had um, and scroll down to, or actually any page, they, they have a programs and you just look at systems and networking, you can find some of the folks that are working there um, in systems and networking and, and you can kind of track if they have any openings. And even if they, the, the those job postings will be posted there too. Um, but you, you just have to keep an eye on that research page because they don't, uh, they, they, 
put all of the different internships on that page. And you just have to find the one that says systems or networking. Can you give any some insight into what the graphics and multimedia group works on? Is that something you're familiar with? Um, I'm not, I'm only familiar. I think I'd probably be familiar with like 5% of what they're doing. Um, I think that that's kind of where HoloLens uh, came out of, I'm guessing. Uh, there are also some, probably they're working on metaverse applications. Uh, and I bet they're working on, on things for teams that I can't even imagine. Um, uh, Microsoft Teams uh, of, of how people work together and how to, how to solve kind of hybrid work um, when people are half in the office, half out, things like that. Um, there's also some really great data visualization folks. I see his face, but I can't think of the name right now um, that are working on great uh, data visualization techniques uh, for lots of different types of data. Um, no, I, I'd encourage you to, to dig into the site. I, I, uh, it's, that, that's all at MSR Redmond and you know, being an East Coaster, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit insulated or Midwestern okay. slash East Coaster. Right. Sorry, not to be more helpful there. Here's a question from uh, someone who had previously applied but didn't get in. Um, will the applications reviewers for the pre-doc program see that I previously applied and did not get accepted for the undergrad internship? And they thank you for the talk. No, no. It's, we get, yeah, no, I don't think so. We don't have good memories. <laughs> I now remember another, the people who have been in the program. Uh, now, another applicant said here, um, uh, they had an HCI interview and they said, here, here's a weird graph you need to solve and write code for it. Uh, this person had the impression that it was all about data structures and algorithms. It could have been for that one. There's a lot of different people working on H um, HCI. Um, so yeah, it depends who, it depends what pro who you're working with and what project. There's a lot, uh, the HCI group is really big in Redmond. Um, there's also some folks in New England that work in HCI too. Uh, and, and they, they're all over uh, different sub pieces of, of HCI. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't let, unfortunately, I wouldn't, uh, it doesn't sound like a great interview question to me. Um, typically we, I don't see those very often of people saying, hey, code this on the spot. Um, okay. So I, I don't see that too often anymore, okay. but uh, I, I would, I, I would encourage you to give it another shot if you're still interested. There's a lot of great questions. I'm going to close with this last one here. Um, I think it's really good. Uh, regarding the undergrad research internship, do internships work on their own research direction or are they paired with a project advisor um, in a similar field? I love that question. Um, the answer is is both. Um, what, what typically happens is they you, the, the undergrad will say three areas of interest that they have. Uh, if they advance to an interview stage, they'll just talk to the researcher who would potentially be that mentor about what they would want to work on. If there's a match, they would be paired up. They would come. They accept the offer. They're, they're sitting there. Uh, the first couple of weeks, you define the project you're going to be working on. Um, it's not like, hey, this is the paper I didn't finish. Will you finish it for me? It's what, would, what can we do together? How can we... Um, you know, what, how, how can you get the most out of this? What are you interested in? Here's what my expertise is. Where's the overlap? That, that's how I see it. Well, thanks for all the questions and we're gonna have Alvin wrap up the show now. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Phil. Uh, apologies if uh, other people have uh, other questions, but I think um, if you go to the links um, that I posted uh, for Microsoft Research, I think you can be able to find your um, answers there. And I guess, you know, Phil, you can also maybe, or we can also, um, have your email address so if they, if they can't find the answers there can they email you as well yep i just dropped it into the chat okay um, great great thank you very much uh, for that um yeah so um if you yourself or you know of other people we're always looking for you know other speakers for our next uh, presentations um please uh, give us a shout uh contact us at vice chair at chicagoacm.org uh, or chair um, at AC, uh, chicagoacm.org. Um, it's, it's a really great way of, you know, um, talking about what you do, whether it's research or whether it is your, your work and, and get other people to, um, you know, understand more about it and, and share your, your, your stuff. So it's really, really great to do that. Um, I've done it myself previously in the past too, and as well as Mark and, and other folks as well. 
And uh, like I said earlier, uh, we have our you know list of uh, previous uh, webinars, um, so you can check out our, our YouTube um, video. So this is like the kind of the the the, the long URL, but the short URL um, I posted I think in the chat or so. But uh, you can just go to bitly uh, bit.ly slash um, ACM uh, CHI uh, video. Um, so you can go and see our uh, previous so. Uh, webinars and I think there was a question yes this, this video is being recorded and it will be posted there uh, shortly um, afterwards and yeah we're always looking for uh, volunteers to help ACM Chicago um, we have a great you know executive committee but we're always looking for more people because this is something that you know we don't do on a full-time basis it's something that we volunteer uh, passionately um, to of our time so if you're interested in uh, working with us in writing planning or have any skills, in videography, especially when we start to do hybrid uh, meetings, um, audio editing, uh, finding future speakers, uh, this is a great way to 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 do so. So um, if you're interested, again, uh, contact us, uh, vice chair at chicagoacm.org, our chair at uh, chicagoacm.org. Uh, and then also as well, um, um, IEEE uh, Chicago is uh, sponsoring this um, real-time communications conference and expo um, at Illinois Tech. Actually, it's, it's virtual um, this year as it was last year. Um, so if you're interested, you can go to the link uh, there, um, rtc-conference.com slash 2022. Um, one thing that I was mentioned about that's related to this is that we actually do have someone from MSR, Microsoft Research, that is giving a presentation um, at this uh, conference um, on Ecopod. So maybe, Phil, you might have heard about um, Ecopod, have you, Phil, or no? No, okay, so Ecopod basically is something within the group of MSR that does urban computing. So you do a lot of research in helping, you know, cities uh, and things like that. Uh, and actually, um, this particular project, they uh, worked together with the uh, city of Chicago. So what they did here is that they measured um, air quality. So MSR in Redmond, they actually created these um, hardware sensors that they close together that actually can withstand um, the forces of nature. And they actually uh, deployed them and put them on CTA uh, bus uh, shelters. Um, and, and you can actually go to a website and it actually uh, shows you, um, you know, what's the air quality uh, in, in, in real time. So um, let me see if I can, well, anyway, um, yeah. So you, it's called Ecopod, you can Google it. Um, so uh, we have someone that's going to be talking about that particular project with uh, Chicago um, in that conference. So you can register for that. All right, so uh, we are 7.05 now. So um, thank you everyone uh, for your questions and for attending uh, this session. Hopefully it was very uh, helpful and beneficial uh, for you to learn more about you know, Microsoft Research and, and what they do. Um, they're a really great organization. Uh, they really help Microsoft a lot. I think, I think you know, personally for me, you know, with Microsoft Research, you know, they're one of the few organizations that they do, they not only just, you know, support the product teams of new technologies, but also in terms of like the future type of technologies. And, you, and it's very difficult to kind of find a research organization, you know, in a corporation. Um, that allows, you know, for that and for that academic, you know, um, individuality and, and and the freedom of doing, you know, research, uh, but also contributing to, to um, Microsoft products. So I believe, I think, Phil, um, with the Xbox, was also came out of Microsoft Research, too, as well. Um, and some of the stuff that you see in, like, Microsoft Word and other things like that also, you know, kind of came from from MSR. So they do a lot of uh, work in, in AI, too, as well. All right, so I think that's it uh, for this evening. Um, this uh, talk has been recorded. Uh, for those who require a professional development hour uh, uh, credit or so uh, for your professional engineering uh, you know, degree or certification, uh, we will post that um, afterwards. So you'll get an email with uh, the link to the recording, um, a copy of, uh, is it okay, Paul, uh, Phil, that we can provide a copy of your slides so people can great. Um, if they miss anything, they can be able to uh, get that from there. All right. So thank you very much. Uh, have a great rest of your evening. Uh, stay tuned for our next um, ACM Chicago event.
just go to our meetup sites um, and you know, and uh, we'll let you know what we have uh, for the next couple of months uh, for this year. And once again, thank you for all your support. Uh, thank you, Phil, again, for his wonderful presentation. Everyone stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll talk to you uh, in another time. Thank you.